I come from a two-fair zone, it seemed like just yesterday I had to take the two of the five to the junction to walk the rest of the way. We used to hop and never drop a token over the turnstiles like Edwin Moses and run from the cops like Jesse Owens. Track stars riding in between the cars. Graffiti is freedom. You know, that's what graffiti is to me, pure freedom. There's definitely a rush. You're in there, you're sneaking in, you're, you're with your homeboys. There's like this feeling, you know, you hear trains, the motor kind of clicking on and off. You hear the tracks change. There's all these elements that add to the whole mystique of that's in a way, you know, you can't even really describe that to people now. I'm, I'm not entirely sure why I write graffiti. It's kind of how like when people have conquered something, they stick a flag in it at the end. And that's my version of my flag, maybe. If I'm upset or I have pain or rage in me, I'll just go out and just destroy shit. For me, writing was a release. It was an escape from, you know, my parents bitching and complaining in the house. It was an escape from my block. I started writing to, to get away from all that, to assume another identity, to have a good time with my boys, to be down with, like, you know, some rebellious shit. You stay anonymous is who you are. And that's the whole point of it. Being like the wind, you know, you can't see him, but you could feel it. You could have this sort of anonymous thing about it where you could, like, have one kind of you portray yourself as one thing and then, like, change into my other costume and I'm this other guy. Superhero. Not many things I can compare to getting on the train daily and seeing your name up on every train you ride. There definitely is a certain high to it. You might feel invincible until people start going over your shit. I feel like a super actor, man, you know? It's, it's pretty cool. In the beginning, it was just about being famous. Kind of getting up to get fame. I mean, everyone wants to be famous. This graph culture is, is serious, man. You know what I mean? It's been handed down from generations to generations to generations, man. Only a real artist will get his light and will get to shine. I mean, a real writer is somebody who picks up a can and goes out and writes in the street illegally. They do what they want to do, when they want to do it. And they, and they do it gracefully and they do it with style. Graffiti writers are the most resourceful people in the world. I guess like most indigenous people, they made the best of what was around them. That same creative nature will help them find the way. The desire is there, people want to paint. They're not going to stop it completely. How are you going to pay for freedom, bro? You don't pay for freedom, you take it. My name is famous, my face. I'm going to take a walk with me. Solid, solid feeling. Let's take a walk with me. Let's take a walk. Take a walk with me. Let's take a walk. Let's go bombing. Let's go bombing. Can't beat this shit. I can't. It's, it's, it's in me, you know what I'm saying? It's like a virus, you know what I mean? With, with, without a cure. I guess I feel a natural high, a natural orgasmic feeling. <laughs> It's like busting a nut. No doubt, definitely. I've been able to shake cigarettes and ex-girlfriends, and graffiti is the one thing that's uh, sustained in my adult lifetime. I don't know if it's necessarily euphoric. I mean, it's a little bit, there's paranoia, there's fear. It's a little tense. It can be tense. Once you got it, it's like tag you it now, you know what I mean? I can't stop it. I mean, maybe it's a, um, a disorder. They need to make an AA program for graffiti, man. Even when you're too old for it, it's hard to quit. It's a disease. I know I have to slow down. And the day is not tomorrow or the day after that. Tagging is the development of graffiti. Graffiti developed out of tagging. There was nothing else that's now called graffiti that didn't, it all started with tagging. That's how it started tagging. Because from tagging, it went on to bubble letters, from bubble letters went on to, to style. And Just big tags, they got bigger, then they got filled in wider, wider, and then outlined, and then it went off from that. I think that having a good tag style is important. I think it's very important. I think it's like having a good smile. It's kind of what greets the world of people around you. Good tag has style. It has uh, some type of flow. Uh, it has legibility. Uh, and it also has repetition. You gotta write it over and over and over and over again. You want your shit to look good, stand out, and look original, and nice and clean. It's a logo, you know what I mean? And with that, you can take it, you can take it beyond. It's, it's basically like the UPC symbol, you know what I'm saying? Get scanned, to get scanned every day by the human eyes. Ultimately, advertising 
you know, for those individuals is something that they will always be connected to. Tag is your, your name, your logo, is the most important element of bombing. I think it's strange that some people have mastered piecing and can't tag. I've seen riders that have, you know, amazing throw-up styles and can't even throw a tag. Sometimes it suggests that you might paint a little bit more than you bomb, and usually you bomb and then learn how to piece. So the evolution's a little off as far as I'm concerned. Your tags is like your soldiers. You lay them down strategically around the city. You know, the more soldiers you have in an army, the more chances you have to win the war. Your tag, your signature is who you are as a writer to the rest of the world, to the rest of the writing community. So once you, once you get your tag, that becomes who you are. If a tag's like a single adult male living alone, a throw up is like when he's married and has kids. A throw up is something you do quick, in a matter of seconds. I mean, you just do a quick fill in, a quick outline. You could do hundreds of them. They're quick and easy to do. If they're done correctly, they look quite good. Some people don't think so, but fuck them. I love throw ups, man. I love doing throw ups everywhere. I love throw ups. I love throw ups. I love doing throw ups and fill ins, dusty ones, solid ones, ones without shadows, skinny caps, fat caps. You can express yourself differently with each one. Each one is, is, has its own identity. A lot of people think that it's a lazy version of doing their name or a simplified bubble style of doing their name, but there legitimately is an art to doing throw-ups. You know, and when I grew up, just about everyone that had a throw-up rocking had a dope throw-up. So the throw-ups are like a tank and shit. You gotta lay the tanks down, not as much as the tags, but every now and then for, for strategic war purposes. You need the big bangers to blow them out. Go crush a yard, go crush a layup with hundreds and hundreds of throw-ups. If you went and did one piece because you thought you were some, you know, you're the man, you want to do one whole car, you spend your whole night doing one piece, that shit gets destroyed, you weren't even there. You did throw-ups, you're gonna be up for weeks. If you have a beef with a rider, throw-ups is like, it's like your ammunition. You go out there and destroy everything they have with throw-ups. A little salt in the wound, you know, if somebody has a whole car that's rocking that might have taken them all night to do, I can take that thing out in about five minutes. I like going over people with my shit, man. I just love ragging niggas. If you go over me or any of my peoples, I'm going over you for life. And the feeling, I feel in this very quick way to just cover up somebody's shit like they wasn't there. You can't tell who was under this shit. The philosophy of peace and burning is based upon styles. Styles evolved out of throbs from you know, riders just adding colors and arrows and, and connections. The pieces back then were big renditions of tags. And it was all about making your name more visible. These are the cats who are developing styles and making their names flip. You know, making them block letters, making them marshmallow letters, making them, you know, platform letters or whatever, making them British letters. All these terms that they were using, they invented that shit. I appreciate Wild Styles. Um, the direction graffiti is going in right now, I guess a lot of kids are doing 3D stuff and recycling other people's wild styles. Whether you call it computer rock or whether you call it marshmallow or whatever, what you do is your style. It's your, it's your imprint on your letters. I think style is a personal taste. Some people that are, would be considered toys have style. To me, style is like a flow, a rhythm to your letters. You know, you gotta make it cartoon-like, make it, make it have some type of life in it. So it's like a foot, a knee kicking. I try to do my S original, half, half of New York City took it, and my F is fat like me. If something looks like extremely sterile and generic to me, it loses its sense of style specialized caps and rulers and levels and it just, it, it, it almost, it almost becomes like plastic fucking surgery. Does that girl really look good with fake breasts, Botox and like huge bubble lips? Some guys, yes, she's gorgeous and I'll go all out for her. Other guys, no, she's like a freak of nature. I love beef, that's where I come in. I love to just take niggas' careers and just end their fucking careers. Beef is a conflict. Beef is, 
Beef is when somebody goes over your shit, you know, when somebody talks shit about you. It's, it's another word for saying, you know, I have a problem with someone. You have writers who come and want to diss your throat or your piece, you have to retaliate. Niggas I see I got beef with, you know what I'm saying? I'm the type of person, I'm a mastermind, you know what I'm saying? I don't just, I don't just jump at it. I mean, I see you, I see you, I'm gonna do the homework for you, you know what I mean? I love going over people. Graffiti, I've said it before many times, is a full contact sport. Careers were ended off of beef. People were, have been killed off of beef. It, it was always a part of graffiti. I mean, in, in a very strange way, it's kind of what kept it competitive and exciting for me. You have people that are competing for the same space on the streets, and you know, you're gonna bump heads with people just because of that alone. People would get run off the line, you know? I can't go paint over there because I have beef with someone. You know, my shit ain't gonna last on that line because cats are beefing with me. I don't think anybody ever wants beef other than when you're like 16 and you want to be noticed and you want to, you know, be paid attention to. Or well, some riders just go over you just because they want to meet you or they want to get famous quick. You know, dudes go over me, I, I, run, I run circles around them. They, they really can't catch up to me. I, I am really that advanced and it's kind of a joke. It impacts people's styles. They have so much beef. They don't ever want to put more time into developing something with more style because it ain't going to last. You know, whether or not it was you and the beef, you got to watch beefs unfold on the sides of trains. You got to watch two crews battling or two crews dogging each other's shit. And you know, it, it's like any good boxing match. You just sit back and kind of watch it and see who wins at the end. Beefs get squashed by fighting. Um, beefs get squashed by like, you know, by saying, hey, forget about it. Wow, I didn't even know it was you all these years. I made a call, you know what I'm saying? It went through the wire. I told the dude, you know what I'm saying? You want to dead the beef, give up a large sum of paint, man. Paint, markers, ink. Beefs get squashed that way too. You like, you know, you pay your way out of a beef. You better, you better, you better be on your P's and Q's, man. You know what you're doing. I don't need any crew to be famous. If I rep your crew, you know, it's because I'm honoring your crew. So you should respect that. What a crew means to a writer is his family. I've known most of the people that I've been bombing with for damn near all of my life. You know, it's kind of like a, a rite of passage, you know? They're giving you your props by putting you down with their crew. Form of respect. You're friends, so therefore you have a, a common interest in something and you do it together. It's like a bowling team. Um, or like a, a group of women that get together and discuss soap operas, which a lot of writers are not too far removed from that. Each one gives each other energy to, to, to elevate. You know, and that's what makes a good crew, elevation. The problem is crews, kind of like gangs, and, and, and gangs was one of the things that I thought Graf was a departure from. It really didn't enhance the development. In a way, I kind of felt like I threw shit backwards. Learning about style, learning about painting, learning about racking. It's the people that you have that, that watch your back for you. Because writing is a violent scene. The definition of a toy to me is somebody that's new to the game, doesn't necessarily understand the rules of graffiti. Maybe it's his tag style that makes him a toy. A beginning writer, somebody who sucks. Letters all discombobulated, you know what I'm saying? An arrow coming out, you like, yo, where that arrow came from? Somebody who just lacks style, period. No style, no knowledge of what's going on. They just go around tagging their name wherever they can. You know, a, a toy is not necessarily like the way you write or something. A toy is more, more of a, a state of mind. Hanging out with a bunch of toys, hanging out with a bunch of cats that don't necessarily get up. They might claim they write graffiti, but they're better known for starting fights, better known for stealing cars, better known for hustling or doing something else. You know, I consider a toy somebody who's not really doing it for themselves. Somebody who's just kind of doing it to get down, doing it for other reasons aside from just personal fulfillment. Just gathering up fame as quickly as possible without going out there and without spending the years that you got to put in to establish yourself. The mind is limited. You ain't fooling us, homie. Unfortunately, dudes stay like that. <laughs> and that's what makes them a real toy. Maybe someone that goes over a piece that's been sitting somewhere, a tag that's been sitting somewhere 20, 30 years. You've been in the game for five minutes. How are you going to go over him? Uh, you know, and nobody from their crew would pull them aside and smack them a couple of times and be like, money, you can't go over this. That shit's been there for 20 years. You just went over some shit that's been there for 20 years. 
because you're an idiot. Yeah, they serve a purpose to destroy. You have to destroy toys. That's only this, they, 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 they're just here to have fun with. Exactly what they are, toys. They might as well be made by Mattel and Hasbro. Predator and prey, you know? You know, toys are suppliers to the many kings of the graffiti world. They usually are quick to give up their paint. Uh, you know, you just, yo, toy, give me your paint. And they're quick to oblige. There needs to be someone you can go over without worrying if he's gonna go back over you. So it balances things out, I think. I just go over their shit and, and crush their fucking feelings. Toy's a writer who just started, really. I mean, everyone was a toy, I mean. I really don't diss toys because I was a toy at one time too. Basically everybody starts out that way, everybody. I was certainly a toy, I mean I was not only a toy, I was almost a, could be called a graffiti groupie. And then I would do pieces on trains and I would see my, my pieces on the trains or my throves and they would pull in, all the other shit looked fresh, my shit didn't look fresh. It doesn't mean that you have to, um, that you have to remain in that category. <laughs> But yes, everyone's a toy at the beginning. Nobody can deny that. And toys that are willing to accept that and learn from somebody who's better than them have a good chance of getting better. Basically, graffiti writers write on anything. I mean, I see writers write on church, man, churches. You shouldn't write on churches or children's little schools. It was irrelevant whether it was a Catholic church, a place of worship maybe, a synagogue or a, a, a mosque. You just didn't write on these places of worship. Now, I've written on churches before, you know what I'm saying? And it's not like I knew it was a church. It was more like I'm hitting it up. Then later on, I'd be like, oh, you don't write on people's houses. You know, you just didn't do that. That's kind of gone out the door as well. Uh, you don't write on cars like just regular civilians cars. I've seen people ride on in, in, in cemeteries, man. I mean, there's things you should respect. You didn't ride over someone else's rest in peace mural for that matter. Usually they were respected in, you know, when there's beef, people will go over a dead person's rest in peace memorial. I mean, I've seen dead people with more beef while they were dead than when they were alive. Well, number one ethic, do not go over scuff. Number two ethic, do not go over scuff. I never rode on nobody's house. I can't front, I wrote on writers' houses, writers that I have beef with. Say you have a little tree-lined street and people are writing on people's fucking garage doors and shit like that. The whole ethics question has changed since I was around too because I remember like people wouldn't, you know, write on trees or they wouldn't write on the floor. There's just some areas like neighborhoods where graffiti looks fucking stupid, like just ridiculous, you know what I mean? It just, it's like, what the fuck are you doing? As the risk goes up, so does the adrenaline. Part of me accepting the fact that graffiti's changed and the rules have changed is that there are a bunch of cats out there that are painting on highways and hanging off of rooftops and, and, and on overpasses. The term heaven spots is a, is in Los Angeles term. They, they use that shit for the highway spots that you gotta climb off, that you, you fall, you're gonna get run over and you're going straight to heaven. That's crazy right there, you know what I'm saying? People see you be like, oh shit, you know what I'm saying? Your name up there. I think nowadays kids are tending to get more into high spots or difficult to reach spots just because things get clean so fast. If you're not doing those spots, you're not staying up, your stuff's going in the week. Yeah, man, it's, it's, it's something that normal people don't do, you know what I'm saying? I'm not a normal person. None of these toys could climb up there and, and diss what I got, you know what I'm saying? It's like if, if you're going to diss it, then you going, you going, you going to work hard like I worked hard to get up there. Sometimes, you know, good spots, they come with some sort of danger with them. My thought on all those spots is that it's, they're fucking crazy. That's crazy, man. That's amazing. You look at it, you know, it's a little amazing, it's a, you know, but you got to keep bombing, you know. It's, it's only impressive one time. Impress me many times over. The illest shit that I've seen is not even in America. It's really in, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo and Rio, where people are hanging off buildings and climbing stuff that's like 10, 15 stories high easily. Yeah, I've heard riders, you know, fall. I've heard, you know, riders have got killed. I've witnessed the result of someone falling off of a bridge by way of a body cast. My man J.A. been doing the, the hanging off of buildings and shit like that. I think I broke my foot, my arm. I crushed three of the vertebrae in my spine, and I broke my hand once. Personally, it's not something that I would ever think of going out there and doing. All I could say is just, you know, don't fall. And um, it's a good spot. 
It's definitely the next level of, of wanting to get, get your name up. And that's not the level that I'm on. Racking is traditional, man. Back in the early 80s, that, you know, in the 70s when graffiti on the subways, everybody racked their paint. The more paint you have, the more graffiti you can do. Um, <laughs> you know, it's got to come from somewhere. You were doing so many, so many trains. I mean, you can't buy paint. I mean, you're little, you're not buying paint. And the majority of the people I came up with all grew up in the projects. We were poor. Where else am I going to get 50 cans? Key. Racking was key. I mean, I was good at racking. And the people I knew were good. I mean, these people were stealing, like, other things before uh, they started stealing paint. You know, these were, these were people that were, like, thieves. I don't think it's, it's as much a part of the culture now as it once was. But, yo, if you told somebody back in the day that you bought your paint, yo, you, you, you might as well just hang it up. You know, racking was always a part of the whole culture in the beginning. I've always racked my paint, um, and uh, that's because it was, uh, you know, hard to come by, and also that's how it was supposed to be done. That's how it was taught to me. Part of the, the sort of excursion of graffiti writing was about going to obscure places and, and getting paint. And in the process, you'd be doing your business, like, to and fro. 100 cans or more, you're doing it. These cats are gold and in one day get hundreds and hundreds of cans, so much that it, the car would be like sunk to the floor scraping. There was times we used to do shopping carts. We used to go to Pergamon and Rickles and fill up a shopping cart full of, full of paint and just walk out the, the garden section. My, I got my one good crazy Iraqi story. Security guard was there, sort of waiting, and I thought, like, the thing is, I just have to do it cool. I just have to pick up the bag and just walk out. Got through the door, started to walk down the street. The guy's like, excuse me, Excuse me. I turn around, I'm like, yes? He's like, you dropped your wallet. Banner Squad's full of shit. People that chase around fucking graffiti writers all day. Come on, man, there's real crimes in this city. We're here to get up, you know? We ain't selling no drugs to nobody. We're not killing the community. We're beautifying the community. What they basically do, man, is they, they, they go out and they're like secret operatives. You know, they're like undercover cops that go out and try to infiltrate and try to arrest uh, writers. The Vandal Squad, as I knew it, was just as savvy as any graffiti artist. They were just as well versed about the history of graffiti. They knew who had beef with who and who was bombing where. And in a weird way, that kind of coexisted with writers because you knew that they were around and you knew that they had a certain list. When we got caught, I was shown a list that actually impressed me. The same people that were at the top of their list would have been at the top of my list. Vandal Squad, um, fuck them niggas. In my opinion, the subways was where it was at. Memories, man, the subways, man. You're talking 70, 79, riding the subways and watching whole cars ride by. You know, you could sit down on your tri at, at your home stop and, and, and soak up this moving art show. So fun, man, I mean, I miss it. I wish it could come back. Whole city used to me in being up on all the train lines and being like king of them. And I took king of the fours and I had every car inside, out, panels, throw ups, went out to the twos and fives, the ones. No matter where you go throughout this city, you're gonna see this guy up. Not like a tag or two tags, but being up a lot. And not just jump out your car, you know what I'm saying? Catch a couple of tags and be out. That's cheating. It's funny how the, this New York City subway movement did kind of just die, you know, slow, it was a slow death, you know, one car at a time. Clean train movement jumped off in 85. The four line was the first line to have the clean trains. And from there on, all the old trains started to be destroyed and dumped in the ocean. Whenever a train was painted, they would immediately take it out of service. So we had to bomb 10 times harder to see our stuff run in service. We had a dream and it was the, like attach life support to this this uh, this thing that we loved so much and to keep it going. And there was a lot of energy and excitement about painting the last train. It became a personal war between us and the transit authority, between us and the Vandal Squad to try to keep it alive, to try to keep it going. Like throwing rocks at a man with a machine gun, you're not gonna you're not gonna win that battle. Not after 9/11. 
I think that those actions are easily misconstrued. You know, Code Orange has uh, changed the way we look at a man in a tunnel with a hood over his head and a bag in his hands. They have it in control, they have it in check, and they have the money to keep it clean. And they have the new stainless steel subways. I mean, you do a train, it gets buffed. I mean, the, the same day it's, it, it gets clean. It really doesn't pay to paint trains anymore. You're only painting for the feeling and for the photo. Graffiti is relevant. Just because you don't see the graph on trains, so you don't want to hit it, it's, it's, it's there to be hit, homie. No matter if it's going to get buffed or not, just for the love of the sport. I mean, they won the war, it's all good. On the subways, but we won the war in general, long term, because now graffiti's worldwide. And that's something you can't stop, and it's art now. Ride the track to the third rail short circuit. Most of graffiti I see around the world at some point was directly influenced by something that they saw that came out of New York. It's global now, put it like that. It's worldwide. It's out in Africa and, and Russia. I mean, that's amazing. You got graffiti that far. I don't know. I think I'm still tripping on the fact that, like, you know, Sprite and McDonald's sell graffiti in a way. Productions, trains, walls, cars, highways, canvases, shows, sneakers, video games, everything. It's not a ghetto anymore. It's not, it's not restricted to that. You know, now it's just not about necessarily a locality or sort of like a lifestyle or, you know, economics. It's just more about attitude. If it gets in the gallery, cool, beautiful. Give me my cheddar, keep it moving. I don't want anything to do with you. I don't want to meet you. I don't want to talk to you. I don't give a fuck about rich, yuppie people criticizing my shit. Fuck it as an attitude has become probably more important than uh, putting up style. If it moves you emotionally, then it's totally relevant. If you're doing it because it's cool and you want to be a, some sort of half-baked rebel or some bullshit like that, then it's only as relevant as that can become for you. We set in the new troops. They're young. They're equipped with new, with new ammo and they're doing damage and they're getting up and, and I love it. We've figured out how to make ink in our own mops, in our own train keys. we figured out how to get in and out of trains undetected. And uh, I'm sure surveillance is gonna definitely put a damper on things for lots of people. The graffiti community will find their way around this. Gonna always be here. Says caveman wrote on the walls, man. Can't stop it. <laughs>